So um, what we have is um, a key event tomorrow. And um, I think mo talking about monetary policy is obviously going to be very interesting for that. And hopefully it will give you a bit of a, uh, an idea of, as to exactly how to interpret everything that goes on. Um, now, I spoke about in, uh, in my first webinar about the importance of economic data and how it can impact on your strategy. Um, so I'm now going to get a bit more specific and just drill down into the individual data releases. And therefore, today I'm going to start with uh, monetary policy. Um, now, the media or you might believe that um, non-farm payrolls is the single most important economic announcement. And to be honest, you do get a lot of volatility around the payrolls data, but markets will look predominantly around um, the uh, topic of monetary policy. Central banks and their interest rate actions are far wider reaching in terms of their impact on the market than um, something like payrolls, which is just an individual release. And uh, the um, it will have a big impact on financial markets. Now, the expectation of how central banks are going to change their interest rates is absolutely critical part of how markets price financial assets. Um, I, I suppose questions such as um, when will the Fed make their move? What um, are they going to do in terms of interest rates? How high could they go? Are they actually going to do more quantitative easing possibly further down the line? These are all questions that um, traders would be asking themselves certainly um, today and tomorrow. And they're all covered in um, what I see as the most important topic of uh, of them all, which is monetary policy. Now, broadly speaking, a country can man manage its economy from two different main methods, which is fiscal policy, which is through government spending and taxation. And alternatively, there's monetary policy, which is interest rate movements by the central bank. Now, obviously, there's a long run argument in economics as to exactly which one should be used to manage an economy. But for the purpose of financial markets, monetary policy is the main player in town. So, hence why we are here today. So, right, first of all, before I get into this, um, we've got the disclaimer because we're going to talk, be talking about live market information. Um, and uh, live market information means that you need to have read and understood this disclaimer. You will get another chance to view it at the end of my webinar. Just a little bit of um, an agenda, what exactly we're going to talk about today, why we're looking at monetary policy and, uh, and why it's so important. Then we're going to look at the general impact on markets on different uh, aspects of monetary policy. Also, what the real impact on the market is um, of, uh, of monetary policy in action. Um, also, how else can central banks impact on markets? You're looking at sort of the various communications that they give out, but also the committee make up with in terms of the hawks and the doves and uh, how they impact on markets uh, on them. Um, expectations of monetary policy. And then towards the end, I'm going to do it, be doing a live market analysis uh, where we're going to be looking at um, key forex majors, uh, indices, commodities. And this is your chance to ask me whatever you want me to look at for you. So get on the, uh, on the chat room and uh, open uh, a question for me and I will look at whatever you'd like me to look at uh, within reason. Um, so let's get into this. Right. Uh, first up, what is monetary policy? Well, traditionally, as I said, a, a central bank can either lower or raise interest rates. Um, so raising interest rates makes it more expensive to borrow, um, sort of inject money into the economy and makes it um, more profitable, interestingly enough, for savers. Um, sorry, that's actually completely wrong. It makes it um, more expensive to borrow and um, hence is actually a, a counter injection to the economy, but um, what it does do is it makes it profitable for savers uh, who actually are withdrawals from the economy. Um, on the flip side of that, cutting rates makes it less expensive to borrow, but provides less incentive to save. Uh, hence why, uh, I don't know whether many of you are based in the UK, but there's always, um, ever since the, uh, the crash of uh, 2008, um, there's always been a, a problem with um, with the uh, pensioners in the UK, whereby they haven't been any, getting any return on their money uh, and they've always been wanting interest rates to go up so they get more money uh, in terms of their savings. Uh, and that's why um, there are always two sides to the argument in terms of raising and cutting interest rates. Um, so um, at the moment, what you are seeing is interest rates sitting at ultra low levels and uh, central banks have had to come up with something different to loosen monetary policy further. 
uh, hence quantitative easing came into practice. Now quantitative easing is the purchase of bonds, usually um, driven by sovereign debt, um, but it can also be other debt um, instruments such as mortgage-backed securities as well. The Fed used to um, buy mortgage-backed securities by the bucket load. Um, but uh, effectively, it's sort of money, uh, money electronically created by the central bank. And what the um, quantitative easing actually achieves is a big debatable topic. Um, there's uh, no real actual answer is in, in terms of what the true um, result is. But um, it's actually designed to try and increase private sector spending and help to generate inflation. That is the argument from the central bank, at least. Um, so they've effectively got, uh, central banks have got three options. You've got uh, loosening monetary policy where you lower or cut interest rates, tightening monetary policy, increasing interest rates, and uh, no change, which is standing pat, um, where the bank of, uh, central bank does not change monetary policy. And you can see here in the uh, diagram, you've got a, a picture of the Fed funds rate, which interestingly enough, um, the, well, the, what the market is expecting is this little line to tick higher tomorrow, just very slightly, by 25 basis points. So why is it so important? Well, broadly speaking, um, all other economic indicators pretty much feed into monetary policy decisions taken by a central bank. So with that in mind, monetary policy is pretty much all important. So all the big in indicators you're looking at, such as inflation, unemployment, uh, growth, will all build into an overall economic outlook and subsequently help the central bank to decide on um, the appropriate monetary policy. Now, I've got a little, little diagram here where you see the economy slowing down and the different aspects of that. And the slowing economy would mean growth falling, unemployment probably rising, and inflation falling as well. And how do you combat that? Well, you use monetary policy to manage the economy by loosening monetary policy, cutting interest rates, and or engaging quantitative easing. Uh, it, it's sort of at this stage that, which I like to use the um, analogy of Goldilocks and the three bears, because you, you see that um, central banks don't want uh, in, economies running too hot. Um, hot. Hot economies would be inflation running out of control, um, but they don't want economies to be too cold either, uh, too cold being um, unemployment rising. Uh, uh, inflation also at too low levels, which is again what, um, what uh, central banks have had to deal with um, at the moment. But what they're actually looking for is an economy that's just right. So they're looking for strong and stable growth, low unemployment, but also mild and stable inflation. And um, that is obviously what uh, central banks such as the Fed is looking to go for at the moment, which is one of the reasons why we're starting to see the Fed um, sort of moving in the direction of tightening interest rates. So what um, or how does monetary policy affect asset classes? Well, initially in the Forex markets, you'll be looking at hot money flows. Now, changing interest rates will uh, from... Um, one country will lead to either inflows on higher rates or outflows of money on lower rates to of the domestic currency. Now, therefore, interest uh, increasing interest rates is beneficial to the domestic currency uh, because demand for that currency will increase. Um, and uh, the reason for that is, as I said, hot money flows because international traders are looking to play the interest rate differentials between two currencies or two countries. Um, and in the long run, uh, you will you will know that um, forex trading is all about interest rate differentials. So in the bond market, um, we've got bonds that are a fixed income asset class. So changes in the interest rates actually changes the relative, and I, and I stress this, the relative attraction of domestic bonds. Um, keep in mind that bonds are a fixed income. So if you're increasing the interest rates, it means that the relative attraction of holding cash over the bonds will change. Uh, therefore, demand for bonds will fall due to the fixed income nature and um, you will get more interest holding cash and therefore there'll be a shift in demand for cash over bonds and therefore bonds will be sold. It's basically simple it's demand and supply economics. Um, and it basically means that the prices of bond will fall and yields will rise. 
don't forget your inverse relationship with your bond prices and your bond yields. In terms of equities, it's a difficult one, actually, because um, it's sort of more of an indirect impact because changing interest rates means that uh, you'll have changes to the corporate borrowing rates um, at both the bank uh, and also the way that uh, the corporate bonds are priced. Um, companies in recent years have been using um, full advantage of uh, record low borrowing costs. I mean, for example, if you look in the States, there has been a significant um, in improvement in the uh, S&P 500. A lot of that has been, well, or certainly up until the latter part of this year, a lot of that has been on the basis of uh, massive share buyback programs. And they've financed basically you, what the um, premise is that uh, companies buy, sorry, borrow money um, at low costs and basically buy back shares because their dividends are worth or their dividends are paying out more than it costs to borrow money. So um, it's much cheaper to buy back the shares and pay out less therefore in on the dividend. So, uh, so hence why, but that's um, hence why companies have been doing that. But it's also uh, when you do that, you actually take shares out of circulation and that also helps to increase demand for the, um, for the shares, hence pushing the share price up. So it's it's sort of a, a, a manipulation of the accounting that actually is a bit, um, well, in my opinion, is a bit uh, bit dodge, but um, companies have been doing it and uh, share prices have been going up. So that, uh, who am I to complain about that? Um, and um, the other factor is that uh, changes to interest um, uh, inter interest rates say for, uh, or borrowing costs uh, has an impact on the man on the street say for example through mortgages and loans um, so uh, if interest rates go down then it will be cheaper for uh, your man on the street to take a mortgage out or to borrow money from the bank hence uh, why um, you actually get an increase in demand through your decrease in interest rates. So you'll be looking at sectors that have anything to do with sort of the man on the street, i.e. sort of stuff like housing and retail and the general consumer. So the broad impact that you get on monetary policy is basically uh, laid out in this little yellow box here where an interest rate rise should theoretically strengthen your domestic currency, should theoretically weaken your bond prices or send yields higher. And also probably weaken domestic equities but I say probably because it's, it is difficult to difficult to quantify really because equities do tend to perform better in looser monetary policy environments i.e interest rates going down however uh, that in that increase an increase in interest rates could also be done through um, the desire to uh, normalize interest rates and uh, that could also help to generate um, confidence in the economy this is the debate in the states at the moment what uh, the impact actually we're going to get on uh, equity markets through the probability of the Fed increasing interest rates. Will it make a, a, a negative or a positive on markets? Well, my take on it is that I think generally speaking, the US needs to um, normalize interest rates and the market will see that and view the, the normalization process um, or the Fed going through the normalization process as a positive because it sort of effectively ends the ultra uh, low um, interest rate environment which is needed through them um, because of the emergency uh, situation that it was in. So exiting, exiting that emergency low rates should theoretically drive confidence in the market. So the real market impact. Well, here we see a chart of euro dollar throughout 2014 into early 2015. You can see here that euro dollar fell from it just just missed out on uh, one euro. Sorry, one dollar forty. Um, it was in in the uh, central bank uh, ECB meeting of um, May 2014 where it initially was moving higher and then Mario Draghi started talking about the fact that the, the ECB was finally ready to start easing monetary policy and ever since that point in time the ECB uh, started to ease monetary policy um, in terms of cutting the deposit rate in terms of ultimately inducing um, quantitative easing and um, hence we had that move 
massively south on uh, euro dollar 3,400 pips in about 10 months so if you actually equate that to a one month move 340 pips a month around not a million miles off 100 pips a week um, so that is pretty pretty big moves in the uh, in the euro dollar market ever since um, the ECB decided to finally move on rates now we have got um, a sort of situation where in 2013 to 14 we had low volatility in forex markets because um, pretty much central banks mirrored each other you had across the board um, throughout the world the major central banks were all in easing mode uh, they had ultra low interest rates they all um, and they were doing quantitative easing the US has fired the gun or certainly fired the gun um, back um, back uh, end of last year in terms of the end of quantitative easing and the move towards possible tightening of rates and therefore we started to see the policy divergence and policy divergence in in monetary in uh, forex is everything it drives volatility in 2015 the expectations have changed uh, and that is because they're um, diverging their policy and markets are increasingly or have been increasingly volatile as a result so we've got the speculation that not only the us and, but maybe even the uk could be hiking rates into 2000 well I was going to say 2016, but the US had um, uh, almost nailed on to make a first rate hike tomorrow. And uh, at the same time, you've got other central banks such as the ECB and the Bank of Japan, which are still very much in loosening mode. Um, you actually, at the moment, the ECB did not loosen as much as it could have done, but still it did extend its loosening program. And don't forget, expectations are everything, absolutely critical. So... In 2014, as, you, as I said about this chart here, you had the expectation that the ECB was going to ease monetary policy and the euro fell massively. It, it didn't actually start really uh, engaging quantitative easing until around about, what was it, 117, 118 in sort of early, early Jan. But the move before that, where, you were, where the ECB was talking about it, talking about it, talking about it, the market was steadily, steadily factoring in this expectation of quantitative easing. And as I said, 3,400 ticks down on euro dollar is a massive move. Now, arguably, quantitative easing has massively boosted equity markets as well. Um, if you look at the chart of the DAX, actually, let me just get that going. Let's get the chart of the DAX. You can see in the early part of 2000, and basically that was uh, pretty much when the, the uh, ECB started to finally engage quantitative easing. I think it was the 22nd, might be wrong. Anyway, so you went from around about 10,000 on the DAX up to 12,390 pretty much there or thereabouts. So over 20% increase in the DAX in sort of three months on the back of the fact that the ECB had engaged quantitative easing. So that was a really strong and impressive move that we saw on the, on the uh, DAX in that time. And the reason was because of the uh, monetary policy shift from the ECB. So, um, what, uh, okay, so that's that. Okay, so how else can central banks impact on the markets? Well, they do um, other things uh, apart from just announcing monetary policy. Um, or in the process of monetary policy, they also do other things as well. Um, now, up until probably tomorrow, um, in, a, in an era of uh, monetary policy where there was not a great deal of movement, everyone was basically just uh, at zero interest rates or there or thereabouts. Um, you got the occasional bout of quantitative easing, but generally speaking, they didn't do a great deal. I mean, say, for example, the Bank of England sort of is it 70 odd months or something or something like that, where they haven't done um, haven't changed the interest rate at all. And it's been sort of three, four years, I think, since they actually moved on quantitative easing. So every time the Bank of England comes out, basically does nothing. Now, th that doesn't necessarily mean to say that the Bank of England doesn't um, shift the price of sterling because they can do that through 
what I've got here is number one is the official statements um, and official statements can be absolutely vital when there are no there's no change to monetary policy basically it, it became um, with the Fed for example it became a, a bit of a game really didn't it the the, the different words that were being used um, as part of the statement have a massive or became a massive meaning for the market say um, back in uh, early part of this year they they sort of um, the Fed was uh, saying that it would retain the level of um, interest rates on the Fed funds rate for a considerable time uh, following the end of its asset purchase program. And then after um, a couple of months, it replaced the term considerable time with the word patience, which was seen for the next couple of meetings. And then patience was removed and the market in immediately looked for um, the possibility of a rate hike and ever since the word patience has been removed which was I think in March April maybe March April the market um, basically ever since then has been playing the game of when is the Fed going to raise interest rates um, we've also got on the statements well certainly on the Fed ones anyway the uh, dot plots which is um, what you can see here uh, which is not it doesn't come out brilliantly unknowingly um, I sort of cut this straight from the Fed statement but this is the dot plot which I think will get probably a lot of attention tomorrow um, the dot plots basically lay out where each of the Fed members believes interest rates should be at the end of that year so at the end of 2015 this is the uh, Fed dot plot in September which is the last time we got one um, the balance uh, saw interest rates at half a or just under half a percent actually that becomes a little bit more stretched out into 2016, doesn't it? And look at uh, there's one chap here, and there was always, <laughs> it's always a big joke whether it was um, Fed member Kochler Kota, um, who is massively dubbish. Um, but anyway, uh, he was sort of out on his own um, at uh, zero. Um, but then, obviously, as the time goes on, the Fed members start to push out there interest rate expectations and exactly how this dot plot ends up tomorrow is going to be driving the expectations of monetary policy I think through uh, 2016 so the dot plots are very important as well and also what we get in uh, official statements is also forward guidance as well forward guidance again in an era of um, where you don't get any movements in interest rates forward guidance became incredibly important Mark Carney um, of the Bank of England um, used like to use forward guidance but then um, he sort of has been criticized somewhat from uh, for flip-flopping around a little bit on his uh, forward guidance which um, has sort of not really given the market too much of a clear view on uh, on the Bank of England interest rates but still um, the uh, both the Bank of England and the Fed like to use forward guidance as part of their monetary policy and you've also got press conferences now press conferences uh, especially with the Fed are massively important they they're used to clarify uh, monetary policy you obviously you'll get Jeanette Yellen fielding a load of questions and the, during these press conferences you'll get a significant amount of, um, of volatility in prices um, especially on euro dollar and prices like gold and also uh, stock markets as well um, the Fed press conference tomorrow is likely to be a pretty heavy one it's going to go uh, it's going to be volatile you're going to get uh, a lot of swings I think because um, she'll obviously be answering questions about um, sort of the way that the Fed is looking out for future monetary policy and um, the market will be flying around on that so during the press conference tomorrow we're likely to see a lot of volatility volatility uh, on the ECB press conferences is um, frequent as well for example in the March 2015 press conference I know it's going bad a little bit but euro dollar jumped um, during the ECB press conference euro dollar jumped on an upgrade to eurozone growth that Mario Draghi announced but then fell later on in the press conference as Draghi spoke about lower inflation expectations and quantitative easing so just because they've announced monetary policy doesn't necessarily mean that's the it that's it that's the end of um, how the market is going to be viewing uh, that monetary policy the press conference can be incredibly um, a volatile event and uh, min meeting minutes as well uh, adds a bit more flesh to the bones really um, in terms of monetary policy now the meeting minutes for example on the Bank of England are very important because you get to an idea of how the members are voting 
and um, that is very important as I'll look at in a bit um, on the hawks and doves section which I'm going to look at uh, just uh, after this bit but um, the uh, exactly how the members are voting are inc is incredibly important to uh, viewing future expectations of monetary policy again and finally outside of the um, of the uh, announcements of monetary policy you also get members giving speeches at conferences um, or on the media on the TV and basically you're, what you're looking out for is the um, sort of shifting um, expectations or shifting sentiment from uh, one member um, because obviously uh, members have a vote on monetary policy and their vote can make a big difference so if, it, if it's like a, a um, a, uh, a member who's hawkish turning dovish or a member who's dovish turning hawkish that is fairly big news and that can have a big impact on uh, on the price of the currency especially and here we go with hawks and doves now um, the policy members as I said are broadly split into two camps uh, hawks and doves um, a hawk would want to see increasing interest rates or a hike in interest rates um, or to prevent them from falling any further or being cut any further. Um, basically, that's because they hold a generally optimistic view on uh, the prospects of, of the economy and um, sort of the, 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 they have a fearing of a potential that um, the economy could overheat uh, if, um, if the action is not taken. Uh, sooner rather than later basically and their natural persuasion is to be tending towards pushing for interest rate hikes or interest rate increases now a dove uh, will be on the other side of the spectrum or the other end of the spectrum and they'll be wanting to either loosen rates or prevent them from rising and um, they're generally more cautious and less optimistic about the prospects of the economy and they tend to be sort of um to tend to feel that um systemic shocks are still playing out uh, and they'd be worried that um sort of raising rates uh, could well have an impact um, if they done if they're done too quickly um, could have a detrimental impact to a, a recovery of an economy um, and could even push the economy back into recession so that's generally why they tend to hold off or tend to sort of put the brakes on a rate hike um, they tend to be far more um, in inverted commas accommodative uh, in terms of their monetary policy stance now there is a third category which I've um, identified here which is the centrists uh, and they are fence sitters uh, and they are generally uh, like to use terms like data dependence to justify their position now um, uh, the, when um, the new Bank of England member uh, Nemet Shafiq joined the Bank of England she was uh, given an interview and she said um, uh, she was asked whether she was hawkish or dovish and she said well she'd had that conversation with her kids and it came out that um, they decided that she would be called she would call herself an owl uh, an owl which um, would be looking at the data and would be wise so um, it's, uh, that's the centrists and basically what you can see here I've um, taken a, a view uh, this is a view from Reuters actually back in I think it was September yeah mid-September where the where Reuters saw the various uh, members of the FOMC. Now these are um, the top two columns up to here are the voting members in 2015, uh, or top two rows, sorry I should say. And then these are the voting members that come out in 2016. And basically what happens is that uh, the voting members of 2015 uh, are rolled out. Uh, and they get replaced by the voting members of 2000, uh, 2016. And what you can see, I would say, is that you get two centrists, or two centrists at the, mo at the moment, whether these have changed or not remains to be seen. Two centrists could well be um, replaced by two hawks. So that actually would mean that in 2016, we're likely to get a more hawkish view on monetary policy than we have at the moment. Loretta Mester and James Bullard tend to be more hawkish than Dennis Lockhart and John Williams. Basically, this is that's what this is saying. Um, you'd say that Charles Evans and Eric Rosengren basically balance each other out, and then you've got Jeffrey Lacker and Esther George who balance each other out. But these two, um, two bit here, uh, Fed should be just erring towards being more hawkish interestingly and that could have an impact on monetary policy in 2016 so um because these are voting members and um 
that would uh, potentially mean a shift in how uh, they move. Now, I think this um, this chart here, although we won't um, necessarily get a complete view of it until maybe Reuters does this again. Um, it'll be very interesting to see how these voters change their views following on from tomorrow's rate decision from the Fed. Specifically, I'd be looking at people like Jeanette Yellen, uh, who carries the balancing vote on the 10 member committee. Um, also, uh, Brainard as well, because I thought I think Brainard's more of a centrist at the moment. Um, but I think Jan Jeanette Yellen could be one uh, that moves um, more to the center. I think Stanley Fish and Jerome Powell could well be the two classics that uh, vote for a hike. And also we could see uh, Lockhart and Williams as well, possibly moving hawkish. But as I said, it's very interesting to see how how it all turns out. As you can see from this chart, there's still quite a lot that needs to happen. Uh, a lot of people need to change their views on how they voted. Only one man, Jeffrey Lacker, voted for a rate hike last month, uh, last meeting. So uh, you need to get four plus probably Jeanette Yellen voting for a hike. So, uh, yes, that would be interesting to see if that does actually happen. So basically, I'm, what I'm saying is get to know your committee, um, get to know your voting committee, because they, they do have certainly on the Fed, they will have a big impact on monetary policy. Uh, and I think that, that will be the case tomorrow. So um, here we have the impact of ECB monetary policy on the euro dollar. Um, this is taken from the last monetary policy meeting that we've had from the uh, ECB. And you can see throughout here, um, this is a, a five minute chart of the um, what you saw is the announcement uh, coming out at uh, 12, uh, 12.30 GMT. That's not even right either. 12.45 GMT. And then you get the press conference at, at 1.30 GMT. And you can see here that you've got a lot of uh, very, very sort of tight trading range right until the, the announcement. Not only that, you had a low volume and that volume started to pick up significantly, didn't it? And into the afternoon, it picked up even more when the US really got going. But look at the two big moves. The two big moves started on the first rate first rate move at uh, 12.45. And then look at the big move during the press conference as well. So what you'd say is um, the reason why euro dollar spiked higher, first of all, was because although you had a 10 basis point cut to interest rates uh, or the deposit rate in this case, um, the market had priced in a lot more than a 10 basis point cut, probably sort of 15 or maybe even 20 basis points the market had priced in. And that disappointment meant that um, the market was underwhelmed by the moves um, or the move from the ECB and hence why the euro strongly uh, moved higher. The second um, disappointment came during the press conference because um, Marajogi then sort of started to lay out, well, basically, um, just to rewind a touch, at 12, uh, 12.45, they, they said in the, um, in the statement that more um, monetary policy action was going to be announced during the press conference. So the, obviously the market got a little bit excited about that and um, there was a bit of volatility around that. Um, ultimately, in the press conference, though, the market was again disappointed because Draghi did not announce an increase in the monthly purchases. He announced an extension of the easing program uh, in terms of months or time, but didn't announce an increase in the amount of, uh, of monetary purchases. And basically, hence why Euro had two legs higher um, in the course of an hour uh, and actually added, was it? Oh, Good Lord, uh, about 400 ticks, I think it was on the day. Um, massive, massive move on Euro dollar. And uh, from that announcement of the press conference um, of no quantitative easing uh, increase, the Euro dollar just kept on going higher. So really strong moves on Euro dollar in that press conference. So that pretty much is the end of my monetary policy spiel. So let's have a look at uh, current markets, shall we? Got the DAX still there, but I'll look at Euro first. Now, what we've had in Euro dollar, that's a bit zoomed out, isn't it? 
is this really interesting move. Look at look at the fact that I'll zoom out again on Eurodollar because you can see here that this big pivot band, 110.50 to 111. Time and time again through this year, 110.50 to 111 has been the turning point on Eurodollar. Is this going to be the same thing again? Well, it certainly is thinking about it. It certainly had um, two or even three goes at it. Got to 10.41 uh, middle of last week. 10.48 yesterday, 10.59 today. Each time it's got to that sort of 10.50 privet area, it started to fall away again. Market doesn't necessarily want to go that high. And I think that that's just the market just playing out a bit of consolidation um, in light of the uh, Fed announcement tomorrow, rather than the uh, rejection necessarily of further euro gains. I think it's just consolidating it in front of that move. I think that move's going to be um, a massive move. Um, exactly how the market um, is going to react to it, it remains to be seen. But my expectation is that um, I think the market is priced in a fairly uh, dovish rate hike. The market is going for a 25 basis point rate hike. That's pretty much given it. I think the market is, though, now um, with in light of a whole range of issues that we've got um, at the moment, I think the market is sort of moving towards um the fact that um i mean you've got all these uh um arguments against um a quick rate hike basically um and the fact is that the the committee generally is fairly as i said fairly dovish in its outlook you know, a lot of members will need to change their views or go considerably the other way um in order to go for an aggressive rate hike um and those dot plots are all important. And the Fed, just generally speaking, is sort of more dovish in its um, in its sort of grounding, I think, than um, the market's giving it credit for or market has previously given it credit for. I think the Fed is um, or the market is sort of pretty much pricing in at least two hikes in 2016 following on from one tomorrow. Um I think the Fed is likely to be quite uh, quite conservative, quite cautious in its uh, in its rhetoric or Yellen's rhetoric tomorrow, and that may well drive uh, dollar weakness um, initially. Um, you could well see dollar sort of challenging that one ten fifty to one eleven. Um, if if the sort of statement or Jeanette Yellen's press conference is a little bit more hawkish, you might even see um, dollar strengthening again and then retesting this uh, one oh eight ten band low. Again, because that is the key area. That is your key pivot level to the downside. Uh, look at that. A uh, couple of levels tested during the middle of the year, retested on a breakdown, retested on a breakthrough, and then subsequently that pivot level is big time in place, I reckon, 108.10. Um, so you've got your two levels there, 108.10, 110.50. Um, I think you're going to be buzzing between those two. A um, lot of volatility I'm expecting tomorrow. Uh, technically speaking, you're sort of bordering on more, um, well, until today's reversal, I was going to say you're, you're bordering on sort of more positive bias to your indicators. But if um, if that uh, market does continue to fall away, you're going to start to see sell signals coming through on these technical indicators again. So um I think just generally speaking, the Fed is all important, though, and you're likely to see uh, a lot of volatility around not only the rate announcement, uh, but also the press conference as well. Sterling dollar. Now, this is an interesting one because what we are seeing is, I believe, um, a recovery basically back towards that big downtrend. Time and time again, that downtrend has formed the basis of resistance. And we're now starting to see the momentum indicators rolling over. You've seen a correction yesterday. I thought um, we were going to see uh, selling into strength and it seems to be that way. Now, if I look on the hourly chart, you will see a, what seems to be breaking down on a head and shoulders top on the hourly chart. One shoulder, one head. One shoulder since I've come on, actually, this is interesting because had a sharp reversal. You had the inflation data for the states today, which showed um, inflation basically in line with expectations. Um, and I don't know exactly whether something's happened. Uh, let me just have a look. Has anything happened? Uh, no, pretty much um, just checking through my news fees. No, nothing 
overly interesting seems to have happened. Uh, it's just pretty much um, moving on that inflation data. But uh, if you see that uh, consistently trading below the 51 figure, 51 figure interestingly is a, a bit of a pivot level. Bit of a range, bit of a level turning turning around on that uh, on that key level. So breaking lower and staying consistently below that would produce give you a downside target, and you'd sort of measure the the sort of one fifty one ten fifty one oh five let's say fifty one ten up to fifty two forty. That's one hundred and thirty ticks. So you project that downwards from fifty one ten. So you're looking at forty nine eighty. If that were to be seen, so you then start to think about this 150 big figure level, 150 big figure, which has been a support in the past. So that would be the that would be your inference of your target if you saw a breakdown. Now look at these momentum indicators. This is why I was getting interested in this move this morning. You had the uh, MACD lines bearishly diverging. I say bearishly diverging because the price hit a higher high on th uh, on Monday, but, but subsequently. The, the MACD lines and the RSI and the hourly chart both hit lower highs. So that would suggest waning momentum and it seems to be coming through now. This uh, deteriorating momentum and you've seen the MACD lines unwinding to neutral and then turning lower. RSI winding on the hourly chart back towards mid 50s and turning lower. That suggests um, deteriorating momentum across the board. So that's interesting. So you'd be looking out for maybe selling into strength. Um, but again, the Fed is the big um, is the big caveat tomorrow. So if you want to trade in front of this, you'd be sort of erring towards the short side and using any sort of technical rebound, uh, I think, on this chart. Um, but certainly cable on the technicals at least is deteriorating for um, for sterling, which would suggest dollar strengthening. And um, it's interesting that we're seeing the dollar strengthening pretty much across the board now. Um, you're seeing euro dollar 50 ticks down, cable 50 ticks down, dollar yen 50 ticks up, um, gold slightly weaker. It's interesting. All these all these are playing into um, this sort of weakening, uh, sorry, this uh, strengthening dollar, which is interesting. And let's go to Japanese yen. Actually, before actually before I do that seeing as I'm talking about it. No, yes, do yen. Wow, big turnaround. Big, big turnaround. Look at that move. And I'll show you why, because that on dollar yen has now completed a small breakout base pattern. Again, similar to. Oh, annoying. Let's try that again. That's cable. Look at that breakout. That's a pretty good one. That's a pretty decent breakout on the on the hourly chart. Bit bit of a pivot level around that 2120 mark, as you can see. Uh, produced the sort of support area and then became resistance, breaking out. So that's arguably completed. A bit of a base pattern. You could sort of arguably measure 2030 towards 2120, which is 90 ticks, isn't it? So 2210. And what's 22.10? 22.10 is the old, annoyingly I haven't got it in here, so what I'll do, I thought I had, the old support of that big trading band, which again became resistance. So that is your big overhead resistance, 22.20. Um, and if you start to see this, well, it is it is going, isn't it? This recovery in dollar yen now. Um, so you'd be sort of looking out for improving momentum, which you've got. And um, maybe look to buy on a dip, but to be honest, the momentum is pretty strong at the moment. So maybe go with the rally. And um, ideally, you'd probably be looking out for buying it around. So like, yeah, the 21.35. So maybe sort of. 15, 20 ticks lower from here would be ideal, but still, it looks pretty strong, and uh, the outlook is improving again on dollar yen, and it certainly looks like it's going to test probably that 22.20 high again. So that is interesting. That is your big level on uh, on dollar yen that you need to be watching out for. Now, um, is this going to change the outlook? Well, 
I'm not entirely sure. I think I still think I'm fairly neutral on the medium term outlook on on dollar yen. Momentum indicators pretty much across the board neutral. Slight. I mean that that improvement in the stochastics has uh, certainly helped. Um, but generally speaking, you're pretty, pretty much flat on on the medium term aspect on dollar yen. Now the one I was going to talk about earlier was the Aussie dollar because I think that is now broken down. No, not quite. No, 71.70 is your key support on dollar yen. So, and only a chance just stalled. But um, what you've got on dollar yen? Here we go. What you've got on dollar yen is dollar yen. To talk about Aussie dollar. What you've got on Aussie dollar is this big top pattern which is building. 7160, I've got it drawn in here. Got big support there, isn't it? 7160, falling back towards that support. Um, you've got the downtrend of uh, lower highs in, in recent days on uh, Aussie dollar. You've got the hourly MACD, which is giving a sell signal crossover, increasingly negative, uh, deteriorating. You've got the RSI with further downside potential. All these are suggesting that uh, you could well get a test of that 7160 key support on Aussie dollar um, so yeah that is interesting so this Aussie dollar chart is sort of straining now isn't it to uh, possibly correct again, even again this uh, uptrend certainly got broken and uh, the move back below that levels so even on the uh, on the momentum I spoke um, I spoke frequently about this um, sort of the 50 level on Aussie dollar actually being a key pivot um, on the uh, RSI it's sort of you're negative when you're trading below 50 uh, and you're positive when you're above 50. Now, not only has the Aussie dollar already um, already sort of broken down. So to complete arguably that sort of top pattern, um, it's, it's also below 50 again. So the momentum is deteriorating. You've got the MACD lines, which, as I said, on the, on the daily chart have crossed over. You've got the stochastics, which are also negatively configured. They've just come to kiss and, and uh, accelerating lower again. So the pressure is building to the downside on this Aussie. Um, so that 7160, 7170 level is really important on the Aussie. Uh, and uh, that could be um, a near-term breakdown. If you did see a completion of that chart pattern, 73.85 is the high, so you sort of about 200 ticks you could see of correction. And I would say you'd definitely be seeing a test of that 70 uh, big figure area support. Would would be my um, would be my takeaway from that, which is the key November low. So if you see that 7170, 7160 support breaking down uh, on a confirmed basis, then confirmed would be a close below um, on the daily chart. Uh, I would say that that's your sell, uh, that would be a confirmed sell signal and uh, you'd be falling back towards 70 big figure. Now, again, you're going to get a lot of volatility on this chart because of the Fed tomorrow. So uh, something that uh, we need to watch out for, obviously, on this chart. But um, in terms of the technicals, the uh, the support at 7160 is important. And uh, as I said, you've got this sort of sequence of lower highs now uh, in the last sort of few days. In terms of your resistance, well, it seems to be a bit of a pivot at 7230. Um, old resistance. Bit of support there, bit of resistance, but became supportive, then broken down. So it's a bit of resistance that comes in around that 72.20 to 72.30. Um, so maybe that would be um, an opportunity if you if you saw a little little uh, bounce now. Maybe you'd see a, a selling opportunity to do a near term position back towards the neckline because obviously until that neckline is broken, um, that wouldn't be a um, a near to medium. Uh, that would be sort of trading too quickly, I think. You wouldn't necessarily presume that that neckline is going to break before it breaks. Um, that is uh, one thing that I would recommend. And let's look at the Kiwi. Oh, sorry, Amir, I didn't see your question. Uh, can central banks change currency in circulation to decrease or increase the value of the currency? Change currency in circulation? Um, not, entirely can, not entirely sure what that means. Um, markets do look at the, um, the money supply 
um, a lot. So the quantity of money uh, in circulation would certainly have an impact on the value of the currency um, because it uh, helps to drive inflation or, di or disinflation. So um, more money in the, in the in circulation theoretically drives inflation. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure what that question means. But uh, if you can clarify that, then uh, yeah, then I'll see what I can do with that. But uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't see that question earlier, Amir. But um, there you go. Okay, so Kiwi dollar. This is interesting. Oh, this is interesting, isn't it? N Z D equals. On that, you would argue. Is there an uptrend channel? It's a pretty good one, isn't it? Annoyingly, I don't know why that's not on that chart. But there we go. Uh, yeah, okay. That's not too bad. I'll keep that. Is that a sell signal? Hmm, interesting. If that, if you closed here and now, that would be a gravestone doji, um, which is uh, a sharp move to the upside, which opens and closes at the low of the day. You haven't obviously seen that yet, um, but... Uh, You've seen a big sharp correction in the last couple of hours with this dollar strength coming through, haven't you? So this is beginning to drag on this uh, on this Kiwi dollar chart. So you're still trading in this um, in this range or this uptrend channel. And let's just see if the RSI on the hourly chart starts to fall away below 40, because that was where your sort of mid mid range. I think if you start to see trading in the 30s, then maybe that would see an extension of the correction, maybe back towards the test of that sort of key low that comes in around 66.90. Um, you've had a MACD crossover sell signal. You've had a stochastic sell signal and stochastics accelerating. So the, the momentum certainly is with the downside. So any sort of um, on a very near term basis, any sort of uh, minor rally or even now, a short position would, should be doing you okay, and um, certainly looks corrective uh, on the near-term outlook. And that would be even more so, I think, if you started to see the RSI trading well below 30, uh, below 40. But those MACD lines are not positive, nor is this, nor is the stochastic. So you could easily see this uh, coming back towards 66.90, which is that reaction low that we saw yesterday. So uh, interesting move on the Kiwi. Now, in terms of um, performance, you'd certainly say that the Kiwi is actually doing pretty well. Um, Kiwi is doing pretty well on the uh, on the last sort of three or four weeks, isn't it, with this uh, uptrend channel? But as exactly where it moves um, on this Fed meeting, well, we've got, as I said, um, a lot of volatility likely to play out, um, and uh, also you've got the the commodity currency, the commodity um, charts, which are having a part to play in the uh, movements on Aussie dollar and also uh, Kiwi dollar as well. So. Uh, watch out for those moving around having an impact on the uh, on the currency but at the moment um, it looks like potentially we're going to get a bit of a, a near-term sell signal with that move um, now in terms of the um, daily stochastics rolling over is that another as I said another near-term sell signal potentially it could well be Okay, let's have a look at gold now. I mean, I've been saying about gold being a, a, a sell into strength for for months now, and uh, I did. I, I mean, I did get caught by that short squeeze, um, but not on a on a longer term basis because I was. I've been saying for a while that um, that there's big overhead band of um, sorry band of overhead supply between 1077, 1098. These two big lows. Uh, anyone who sort of bought in that in those area in that area would be looking out for a rally as a chance to sell and that seemed to be how that short squeeze played out on the euro uh, on the um, on the gold price uh, on the ECB meeting because since then we started to see the gold rolling over look at these momentum indicators you've got the um, stochastics which are uh, have rolled over and given arguably a sell signal or a near-term sell signal and um, MACD lines looking um, well they didn't really recover at all did they um, RSI also sort of rolling over as well. So it certainly looks like there is a big band um, of resistance. Every time it gets towards 1077, that's seen as a chance to sell. Um, you've had sort of intraday moves towards that level in sort of four of the fast five days, 
apart from obviously today because you had the, the continuation of the downside move. But again, um, even on the, today's recovery, you had the selling pressure coming back in. Um, you got a bit of a, a near term sort of downtrend channel going on here, but certainly the selling pressure continues on this chart. Um, RSI um, continues to fall over under 50, has done last couple of days. That's interesting on the hourly chart. The MACD line's negatively configured, just suggesting any any unwind is a chance to sell. Stochastics just rolled over, given an um, arguably near-term sell signal. So it looks like you're going to get pressure on the supports coming in now. So where would you be looking out for? Well, you'd say, obviously, yesterday's low around 10.60. But ultimately, 10.57 seems to be uh, that low on the fourth seems to be in place. But 10.45.85, which was the spike low uh, on the 3rd of December, I'd say that that is not a million miles away from where you'd probably be testing. Um, it just looks as though uh, the gold price hasn't hasn't yet played out its downside move into to its entirety. Uh, I'd be expecting sort of pressure back on these lows. Um, and uh, you could see it if um, if the Fed uh, is slightly hawkish um, in its rate hike. Um, it just doesn't look as though the gold price wants to rally. I mean, the last few days we've had safe haven trades um, outperforming and you didn't get that on gold, um, certainly yesterday. Uh, there was um, a big, big, uh, big downside move. And I think the, the fact that that comes with... Um, the ongoing um, sort of pressure on commodity prices as well. I think that's a concern for the gold bugs, and uh, seems to be there that anyway. Uh, very quickly, I'll look at oil. Um, to be honest, it'd be interesting to see it because I haven't looked at it yet for the last couple of hours anyway. Yes, the recovery is still going, isn't it? It's interesting. How far can this move go before it gets stuck? Um, you've got a big, because the, the thing I noticed was you've broken the downtrend. Oh, what? Let's get rid of that. That was annoying, wasn't it? it certainly wasn't meant to happen. Big downtrend broken. You've actually also got, arguably, a bull flag. With this move here, you could argue that that's a bull flag. So, how much is that going to play out? So, you sort of measure the height of that and then measure it up. So, sort of 38 to 38.50. Interesting that that's sort of around about where the resistance comes in from um, last week, isn't it? Interesting band of resistance around that sort of 38.50 mark up towards 39. So, you could well see the oil price bouncing into that. Whether it continues or not remains to be seen. There's a lot of bearish fundamental pressure on gold uh, on oil at the moment but uh, certainly looks as though it could be recovering uh, near term you've got support around that 36 mark now okay so that um, that was my presentation uh, here's my Twitter feed um, at Hantech Rich is my handle uh, all my research is on our website which is at uh, sorry um, Hantech uh, uh, can't speak hantechfx.com forward slash market dash research and all my stuff is posted there um, and without sorry with that in mind uh, here's my disclaimer again and I wish you good luck in your trading and I will speak to you again next time thank you very much